This video is sponsored by Babbel, an easy to use language learning app that teaches real world practical conversation. Click the link in the description for 65% off your subscription. Kendrick Lamar is one of the most celebrated and dissected artists in the world due to his penchant for writing incredibly layered and nuanced music. The lyrical depth in his songs earned him such reverence that they're studied in college courses and raked in countless accolades, including a Pulitzer Prize for music, the only rapper who's ever been granted one. This, along with his ability to connect to audiences through hard-hitting lyrics and pressing themes, has made him one of the most influential musicians of our time, and arguably the voice of a generation. I'll be covering some topics I may not be able to fully appreciate because they don't apply to me directly, but I hope I can convey and interpret them honestly and with the genuine appreciation I have for his craft. He's dedicated his art to telling stories of impoverished, neglected, and oppressed people with the aspiration of making a legitimate difference in the culture. But in his pursuit to change the world, he's also carried the weight of it on his shoulders. Although he's embraced his role as hip-hop's savior, using his celebrity and influence to say something profoundly moving and inspiring, he constantly questions if he's truly made a difference in his community. At the same time, he's grappled with the authenticity of the message he's spreading, comparing it to his actions and inner thoughts, ultimately leading him to have a new perspective on the culture he spent so long prioritizing. And when I say culture, I mean the social and political elements that make up hip-hop, black, and American culture as a whole, and how the three interact and coincide. So in this video, I want to discuss how Kendrick's understanding and influence of this has evolved over time, to the point where he's re-examined what the culture means to him, and what he means to the culture. In 2011, I was initially drawn to Kendrick's technical abilities. The permanent beast and the demolition, bringing up the street, but a partition, but a Already, he had a distinct energy and cadence that made him seem superhuman when it came to unleashing mind-melting verses and lyrical acrobats. But beyond simply his rap skills, what really made me want to dig deeper was the complexity and depth of his songwriting and wordplay. Songs that at first seemed straightforward eventually grew to be more thought-provoking the more he sincerely tuned into his words. She said, read between the lines. Yep. For instance, the first song that really made me a fan of his was ADHD. On the surface, the song's ambient quality made it feel like a classic weed anthem. But the serene beat masked the commentary on a generation prone to self-medicating. The song asserts that the shared short attention spans, constant search for distractions, and overwhelming sense of anxiety felt by an entire generation can be traced to the politics of the 80s. You know what we crack babies because we bought in the 80s, the ADHD crazy. When I listened to Section 80, I realized this emphasis on Ronald Reagan's politics wasn't just a one off, but a central theme of the entire project, highlighting its continued effect on his community. 1987, the children of Ronald Reagan break the leaves off your front porch with a machine blow Section 80 put a microscope on the trickle down effect of long lasting systemic oppression and offered what felt like personal stories about the people affected by it. It was a stunningly nuanced and mature introduction to a relatively unknown artist that slowly caught the attention of many fans and hip hop legends alike. I wouldn't necessarily say he blew up overnight, but Section 80 launched Kendrick into the hip hop zeitgeist as icons of the genre christened him the next big thing. You ain't good at what you do. You great at what you do. And the people out here, they represent it. You got the torch. You better run with that. With this immense praise, I think he took it upon himself to dedicate his career to the culture and let his song speak for an entire group of people. In a 2011 Hip Hop DX interview, he said, People come up to me every day and tell me how I'm making music that's helping them get through life and I'm speaking for them. I couldn't help but sit back and realize that the music is just bigger than me now. I can't be selfish and just make records that I want to make. Now I'm talking for a whole generation that needs help, so I felt it was my responsibility. Maybe it was a bit overzealous, but I think a lot of us appreciated the ambition and collectively sensed a similarity to Tupac, as Kendrick was making incredibly layered music at such an early stage of his career. Kendrick's admiration for Tupac dates back to his childhood. The story about his father bringing him to the set of California Love has become the stuff of legend. That's the person we've been looking up to um, since I was born, man. My pops rolling down Rosecrans bumping his music in Compton. As an eight-year-old kid, watching them do Cali Love, but when they was on Rosecrans and Compton, I was right there. Of course, plenty of rappers have cited Tupac as an inspiration, but I don't think any of them have been as dedicated to filling his shoes as Kendrick. She's 12 years old, guess he's having a baby. In love with the mother, and crazy. She played Mr. Shakur, 
That's a favorite rapper bump and Brenda's got a baby while a pervert yelling at her. By the time I finished listening to Section 80, I couldn't help but think of Kendrick as the heir apparent to the 90s legend. And I immediately thought of this famous Tupac quote. I'm not saying I'm gonna rule the world or I'm gonna change the world, but I guarantee that I will spark the, the, the brain that will change the world. And I guess I wasn't alone, as I ran across tons of articles and online comments citing the same quote, claiming Kendrick to be the mind Tupac prophesies would change the world. So I think many of us, and maybe even Kendrick, invited the comparisons and expected him to do great things in music. And that's our job, is to spark somebody else watching us. So when he released his major label debut, Good Kid Mad City, already graced with widespread acclaim, he somehow exceeded his fans' loftiest expectations, as many deemed it an instant classic, with Pharrell calling Kendrick this era's Bob Dylan. With a combination of sprawling, atmospheric sounds and G-funk beats, Good Kid Mad City unfurls like a movie, calling back to classic films like Boys in the Hood, Poetic Justice, and Menace to Society. We, st we supposed to fight over a bitch? They stopped the homie out over a bitch. Through skits and snippets of dialogue sprinkled across the album, we get a non-linear account of a young Kendrick and his friends cruising the streets of Compton, California. The album's a peek into his adolescent mind, obsessing over sex, posturing to his friends, and often getting caught up in their criminal ventures. In fact, I got fired cause I was inspired by all of my friends to stage a robbery the third Saturday I clocked in. On the surface, many of the songs sound like a glorification of this lifestyle, but the lyrics clearly depict hesitation and regret about his participation in it. He alludes to the use of drugs and alcohol as a way to wash away the trauma of living in such a toxic environment. Make an excuse that your relief is in the bottom of a bottle and the green is in the For Kendrick, he takes part because he simply wants to fit in with his friends. Really, I'm a song. But also, the lifestyle was so deeply normalized that he didn't see it as something out of the ordinary. Regarding the constant crime and imprisonment in his community, in the aforementioned Hip Hop DX interview, Kendrick said, Throughout my years coming up, my uncles were always constantly in and out of jail. All my other homeboys were going through the same type of experience. I thought it was regular to do that. I was thinking that we were all supposed to be institutionalized someday at some time as black men. It's indicative of how easy it is for even a good-natured person to be corrupted by flawed ideas of what it means to be real. Hating on money, power, respect, in my will. I hate the fact none of that sh make me real. The album culminates in a violent scene that leads to the death of one of Kendrick's friends, Dave. From this tragedy, Kendrick and his surviving friends repent for their sins as Kendrick turns a new leaf, leaving behind everything he thought made him real and embracing his next chapter. Although I have my favorites from the album, I think the most significant track was Sing About Me. Over a subdued guitar sample, the first half of the song is a somber reflection of the untold stories of his hometown. Starting from the point of view of Dave's brother, he comes to a realization about his role in perpetuating a cycle of violence, and ponders the fate he's resigned himself to, reminiscent of Doughboy and Boys in the Hood. Shit just goes on and on, you know. Next thing you know, somebody might try to smoke me. And if I die before your album drop, I hope. The second verse calls back to Keisha's song, this time from the point of view of her sister. In it, she questions Kendrick's motives for making the song, believing he's simply exploiting Keisha's life for profit. My sister died in vain, but what point are you trying to gain if you can fit the pumps I walk in? But finally, Kendrick provides his own perspective, revealing the love he has for the people he writes about and how their stories inspire him. And through telling their stories, he immortalizes them through song, ultimately hoping to affect his listeners the same way these people influenced him. Hope that at least one of you think about me when I'm gone, am I worth it? Good Kid Mad City was a loosely autobiographical coming of age tale about Kendrick's life navigating gang violence. But beyond that, it was a depiction of the environment he rose from and how difficult it can be to try to be a good person in such a destructive setting. A lot of people think it's really just, you know, about me, but it's really a reflection on the people I grew up around. And um, I just really wanted to put them ills out there and then it really explain, you know, a certain situation. In the city. Good Kid Mad City cemented Kendrick as the preeminent storyteller and premier wordsmith of his generation. It wasn't just that he was saying something important in his music that made him such a revered artist, but his ability to balance sonically innovative and interesting sounds with complex lyrics. And somehow, all of this crescendoed with Kendrick's infamous control verse. Originally an unreleased song due to a sampling issue, Big Sean elected to unofficially release it anyway. I knew how important it was, man, and I just wanted to give it out there and like orchestrate that and push the culture forward, man. I haven't seen a, a hip hop song uh, stir up this much excitement in, 
in years, really. While there were other great verses on the song, it was Kendrick's maniacal three minute epic that culturally felt like the drop of an atom bomb. I'm Echofelli's offspring, I'm the king of New York, king of the coast, one hand I juggle them both. But what stuck out to most fans was his direct challenge to roughly a dozen rappers, as he called them out by name. There goes for Jamaica, Big Crit Wale. Pusha T, Meek Mills, ASAP Rocky, Drake. While claiming to be the best rapper isn't anything new, the inflammatory way Kendrick addressed his peers, along with the success and critical acclaim of Good Kid Mad City, made his words hold that much more weight as he effectively dared any one of them to prove him wrong. I got love for you all, but I'm trying to murder you. The verse caused a frenzy. It seemed like everyone was talking about it. Plenty of rappers responded, made light of the verse, or even dismissed it. But there was no denying, Kendrick was at the top of his class, and he knew it. He had the culture in the palm of his hand, with each word seemingly sending shockwaves the instant he spoke them. Now, he wasn't just reflecting the culture anymore. He was the culture. This is my life. I'm not speaking to the community. I'm not speaking of the community. I am the community. After deciding to use his music to reflect the community, it was clear Kendrick began to feel the weight of the responsibility he put on himself. You could hear this in his next album, To Pimp a Butterfly, his critically acclaimed follow-up to Good Kid Mad City. When I first listened to the album, it was a jarring experience, unlike any rap album I'd ever heard. Featuring a heavy jazz influence and even feeling reminiscent of spoken word poetry at times, I don't think any of us were really ready to digest the intricacy of the album's message when it first dropped. All I need, evidently all I see was Batman. And I knew, I knew from the jump that that was going to be a challenge, you know, for, for my listeners' ear. But if I'm challenging myself in the studio, I want to challenge you as well. But since its release, To Pimp a Butterfly has been one of the most talked about, broken down, and studied pieces of music in recent history. And I would argue it's one of the most lyrically dense albums ever made, packed with a litany of double meanings and extensive musical illusions. When you got the yams, what's the yams? Because of this, I don't think I could possibly discuss everything the album touches on without making a 5 hour video. So if you're looking for something more like a track by track breakdown, I recommend the Dissect podcast series. Anyway, through the whirlwind of an experience, fragments of a poem are scattered across the album, culminating in a hair raising conversation between Kendrick and what feels like the ghost of Tupac. What you mean by that? What the ground represent? The ground is going to open up and swallow the evil. Right. Kendrick completes the poem in the album's finale, and it becomes clear each individual song is the fleshed out thoughts he had while writing the poem. For example, in These Walls, it initially comes off like a sultry ballad filled with allusions to sex, but we later learn it's really about his petty revenge against the man who killed his friend, as he used a celebrity to sleep with the killer's girlfriend. And the sing about me, retaliation strong, you even dream about me, kill my homeboy and God spared your life. The song's an elaboration of what he meant in the poem when he said, I remember you were conflicted misusing your influence. Sometimes I did the same. Abusing my power full of resentment. This internal conflict persists throughout the album, especially in songs like You, where Kendrick's vocal performance is messy, slurred, and wildly emotional, mimicking a drunken tirade as you hear clinks of a bottle while he yells at himself in the mirror. Loving you is complicated. Loving you is complicated. The song is reminiscent of his 2014 feature on YG's Really Be. They kill Brace, they kill Chad, my pick on me, pup. Puppy eyes on my face, bruh, and I rip that bit drinking. You fleshes out the grief and self hatred hinted at in the song. While he's made a point to use his influence to change his community, he feels like he's failed in making a difference in the lives of the people closest to him, while also drifting apart from them. You ain't no brother, you ain't no disciple, you ain't no friend. A free never leave copy for profit. This, along with his teenage sister becoming pregnant, causes him to to question if he's made a difference at all, since he'd written and dedicated Keisha's song for her, in hopes of protecting her from the path she ended up going down anyway. My little sister 11, I looked her right in the face the day that I wrote this song, set her down in breath play. You reached in front of 100,000 but never reached her, I could tell you you ain't no leader. And in Black of the Berry, he speaks to his own ambition to uplift the culture through his words, while at the same time still holding hatred in his heart. He darkly twists the lyrics of Tupac's Keep Your Head Up, an uplifting tribute to women, and turns it into something sinister. Say the black of the bed, the sweet of the juice. I say the dark of the flesh and the deep of the roots. At first, the song is about the anger he has towards a racist society that continually marginalizes him and his people, but its message is subverted with his final lines where he brings the attention back onto himself. So why did I weep when Trayvon Martin was in the street, when gang banging make me kill a 
While the album is definitely about a larger issue of racism in America and contains themes alluding to many things regarding black culture, Kendrick frames it as a tumultuous personal journey of understanding how to navigate such a harsh reality. It's why the song I is such a climactic moment in the album, where Kendrick finally comes to an important realization. I'll be honest, when I first heard I as a single, I wasn't a fan. I thought it was a little too positive, like a hip-hop kumbaya campfire song. But it grew on me over time, especially in the context of the album, as it marks the moment Kendrick comes to the epiphany of what it means to love himself. Self-love has been a sentiment present in Kendrick's music for a long time. Love is not just a verb, it's you looking in the mirror. But in this instance, it's through the lens of a black person in America. While you was about looking in the mirror and hating what he saw, and in turn projecting the self-hatred onto people that looked like him, I is about learning to love himself and ultimately loving his fellow black person. In the album's finale, Mortal Man, Kendrick recites two poems for Tupac. The first being the one heard throughout the album, and the second about the metaphor of the caterpillar and the butterfly. The caterpillar is a prisoner to the streets that conceived it. Its only job is to consume everything around it to protect itself. The caterpillar represents the people struggling to survive in a grim environment, who resent those who have left for bigger and better things. The butterfly represents the beauty within the caterpillar, but having a harsh outlook on life, the caterpillar sees the butterfly Weak. It's a resentful sentiment that Kendrick expressed earlier in his career. I wasn't jealous because of the talents they got. I was terrified they'll be the last black boys to fly out of Compton. Then he said that he was the same age as myself and it didn't help because it made me even more rude and impatient. But the core message in To Pippa Butterfly is that everyone has something special within them. Although the butterfly and caterpillar are completely different, they are one and the same. Is hinted at in the opening words of the album. And because of this, Kendrick's poem implores his community to see the light within all of us, maintain hope in a cruel world, and unify to break the cycle of violence and oppression together. So when he finishes the poem and asks Tupac for his thoughts on it, I believe Pac's silence speaks to the end of the internal struggle Kendrick alluded to. Just as his final words on the album imply, There's a spirit. We ain't even really rapping. We just letting our dead homies tell stories for us. To Pimp a Butterfly is essentially Tupac's message being sent through Kendrick. So it's no wonder the original title for the album was To Pimp a Caterpillar, which would have made the acronym for the album Tupac, or Tupac, as his first poem was a message to Tupac, while the second was a message from Tupac. Pac was a prophet to be, and everything he's talking about is actually going on today. To Pimp a Butterfly is rightfully considered an all-time classic, and it was met with universal acclaim. Kendrick was still making moments, even alongside other titans of hip-hop, but now he was making moments that transcended just music, as his song All Right became the unofficial anthem of the Black Lives Matter movement. Following To Pippa Butterfly, he released Untitled Unmastered, which was essentially a compilation of demos and unreleased tracks during the time he recorded To Pippa Butterfly. Of course, there's a messy, incomplete element to the album, but the ideas he was juggling were indicative of the array of swirling thoughts he had at the time, that maybe weren't fully fleshed out, or just didn't fit what he wanted to say on To Pippa Butterfly. Still, he was using his influence to make profound statements, with nuance and empathy, while artistically creating some of the most compelling music in recent memory. He was shedding light on important issues in his community, actively trying to make a difference, and his music was spreading further than he could have ever imagined. But it seemed like, often, the message was either misconstrued or ignored entirely. This is why I say that hip-hop has done more damage to young African Americans than racism in recent years. While Kendrick was making culturally relevant music, it seemed like the bigger themes in the songs were falling on deaf ears. As was the case of Keisha's song having no effect on his sister, swimming pools becoming a drinking anthem when the song was explicitly a commentary on alcoholism, and All Right being ripped apart by conservative news channels as an incitement of violence, even though it was about persevering through trauma. How can you take a song that's about hope? and turn into hatred. It clearly hurt Kendrick to see his music be so grossly misinterpreted. This feeling directly led to his next album, Damn, a project noticeably more cynical than his previous work. It felt like an extension of Black of the Berry, as it explored Kendrick's hypocrisies while also highlighting the toll uplifting an entire community had on him, and the conflict he felt about his inability to practice what he preached. I think this is most apparent in XXX. Through a chaotic beat filled with horns and police sirens, a friend asked for Kendrick's advice after his son is killed from street violence. But 
while Kendrick is an advocate for peace and unity, he admits that he'd be overcome with anger if he were in his friend's predicament. He sugarcoat the answer for you, this is how I feel. If somebody kill my son, then me somebody can- The song ends with a sobering refrain about America and its relationship with guns. Specifically, how a country that glorifies gun ownership would then demonize black communities for having them. Overnight, the big rifles then tell Fox to be scared of us. Why is it that there's a gun shop on almost every corner in this community? Why? Why? They want us to kill ourselves. We're left to ponder Kendrick's and also America's hypocrisy in preaching peace when they're just as prone to violence as the ones they condemn. It links to the prevailing question in the album. Is it wickedness? Is it weakness? Interestingly, Damn is an album meant to be played both forwards and backwards, with several songs hinting at this by incorporating reverse vocals and musical elements. In regards to the reverse playlist, Kendrick said, I don't think the story necessarily changes. I think the feel changes. The initial vibe listening from the top all the way to the bottom is this aggression and this attitude, you know, DNA, and exposing who I really am. You listen from the back end, and it's almost the duality and the contrast of the intricate Kendrick Lamar. Both of these pieces are who I am. The album opens with Kendrick assisting an old woman before being abruptly killed by her, hinting that his death was due to the moment he let his guard down to help her. Played normally, the rest of Damn is a deconstructive journey as Kendrick sheds all the wickedness he holds in his spirit, transforming his pride to humility, his lust into love, and his selfishness into godliness, cleansing himself until he's eventually one with God. This what God feel like. The album climaxes with Duckworth, as Kendrick recounts how his label CEO, Top Dog, and his father once crossed paths, noting the small decisions that drastically impacted their lives. And in contrast to the album's opener, Duckworth ends with a thought about his life if certain events that led to him being a rapper never happened. Because if Anthony killed Ducky, Top Dog could be serving life while I grow up without a father and die in a gunfight. Conversely, when the album is played backwards, the story centers on the alternate reality where Kendrick grows up without the guidance of his father. In this version, his soul is slowly poisoned by a cruel world, leading him to absorb all the evils around him, corrupting the purity of his heart. Notably, when Kendrick's cousin calls him about Deuteronomy, he interprets the Bible passage as an unavoidable curse. Deuteronomy say that we all been cursed. I know he walks the earth. But it's money to get. The reverse track list culminates with DNA, where Kendrick's wickedness is so ingrained in him that it flows deep within his blood. Yet, even with this life of wickedness, Kendrick eventually dies from a moment of weakness, implying either that this one act of kindness wasn't enough to atone for his sins, or that he would have met this fate regardless if he was wicked or weak. No matter how the album plays, Kendrick is killed in the end, so we're left to decide if it's worth it for Kendrick, and also ourselves, to be wicked or weak. There's plenty of ways to interpret the meaning of Damn's reversibility, but to me, the album sounds like a nihilist interpretation of reality, almost resigned to an apathetic world, illuminating a central theme of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Damned if I do, if I don't. Yeah. I think Damn speaks to his disillusionment with his role as a voice of a generation and the frustration regarding his impact. I feel like this gotta be the feeling where Pac was, the feeling of an apocalypse happening but nothing is awkward. Until finally, he realized the only thing he could control was himself and how he went about life. To pimp a butterfly would be the idea of the thought of changing the world. Damn will be the idea of I can't change the world until I change myself. The lead single, Humble, was particularly notable. Featuring a trunk rattling beat with piano chords that sound like they're being smashed with sledgehammers, the song is a flex about Kendrick's success and influence. But I think his concert performance of the song reveals his true feelings about his fame and celebrity. While he's taken it upon himself to be an important figure, the song is a reminder that he's still just a human being. So as he performs Humble, the music cuts out to let the crowd take over, making it feel like they're reminding Kendrick to show his humility. A lot of people have chosen you to be the voice of this generation. Oh mm -hmm. Does that put, what kind of pressure does that put on you? It, 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 it puts, I don't want to necessarily say pressure. All I can, you know, do is continue to be an actual human being and, mm -hmm. and, and then to show them that, you know, I go through the same emotions and the same, you know, feelings that y'all go through. Yeah. You know, so if they, you know, put that as being the, uh, leader of this generation, then so be it, because all I can do is express myself and hope you, you know, take something from it. 
Following Damn, Kendrick went on to executive produce the Black Panther album. Listening to it, I was honestly surprised that a Disney movie allowed him to have such creative freedom. There's notable parallels between Kendrick and the film's main character, T'Challa, as both share the responsibility and burden of upholding and influencing a culture. But what I found most interesting was when the themes mirrored the beliefs of the film's antagonist, Killmonger. In the film, Killmonger resents the country of Wakanda for hiding their advanced technology and neglecting to use their power to help the struggling people of the world. In regards to Kendrick, I think the character gave him an outlet to hint at his own resentments. Through a mix of African and West Coast music, Kendrick curated one of the best movie soundtracks in recent memory. But more importantly, I think it was a glimpse at how he was starting to feel about his own position in the culture. Following the Black Panther album, the world seemed to grow more divisive and chaotic. Specifically in 2020, tension caused by police brutality and systemic racism in America seemed to reach a boiling point. And while Kendrick was active in protest, many looked to him to drop music or make a statement about what was going on, a demand reflecting the sentiment that it was his responsibility to say something. But he mostly stayed silent and far from the public eye. That is, until 2021, when he re-emerged on Family Ties with his cousin Baby Keem, hinting at why he was absent during such a critical Time. Clearly, he felt jaded by the sudden wave of trendy activism and much of its insincerity, so I think he didn't care to appease the cause for him to say something unless it genuinely came from the heart. I come from a generation of pain will murder his minor. So it was only right that less than a year later, Kendrick released The Heart Part 5. Over a haunting funk groove, Kendrick meticulously broke down his thoughts on what so many considered a defining aspect of the culture. The song is an analysis of a continued history of trauma in the black community. This led to the seemingly endless cycle of pain. That's culture. 23 hour lockdown. Did somebody call said your little nephew was shot down. The culture's involved. Interestingly in the video, Kendrick's face periodically morphs into different people, ranging from the irreparably flawed to tragically lost, painting the complex picture of black stars who've fallen in the eyes of the public, either metaphorically or literally. It's truly stunning to see Kendrick transform from persona to persona, reaching the source of their demise and martyrdom to the community they come from. But that's the culture, crack a bottle, hard to deal with the pain, we are sober, by tomorrow, we forget the remains, we start over, that's the problem. In the song, Kendrick reveals his love for the people that make up his community, but rejects the idea that their collective trauma is something that defines them. Nah, in a land where hurt people hurt more people, fuck calling it culture. The Heart Part 5 was the precursor to Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, an emotionally complex and at times difficult album to listen to. As a common refrain about the project was that it sounded like a series of therapy sessions. One of my favorite lines in the album is where we say you really need to go to therapy. And I say real niggas don't go to therapy. <laughs> Cause that's how niggas feel, you know what I'm saying? We grew, we grew up where our parents don't know about that. Our grandparents don't know about that. We learned to hold all that shit in. You know, I'm, I'm still stuck. Uh, my pops think fucking need therapy for It's growth. A double album. The first disc features Kendrick identifying the roots of his issues and starting the process of unlearning the toxic traits and unhealthy coping mechanisms he'd developed over the years. In songs like Father Time, he pinpoints the generational trauma passed down from his father, as well as the behaviors his peers mistake for masculinity. While he's appreciative of his father's presence, Kendrick inherited his inability to be emotionally vulnerable. This generational toxicity caused a rift in his relationship with his partner. Through the album, he admits to using sex to avoid dealing with trauma. The effects of his infidelity are best portrayed in We Cry Together, a song that feels like walking in a conversation you weren't meant to hear, as Kendrick and his partner air out their dirty laundry in a fight they seem all too accustomed to having. In an homage to poetic justice, the chorus's flurry of f yous bluntly expresses the couple's turmoil. The song ends with a refrain alluded to throughout the album. 
stop tap dancing around the conversation. Hinting that Kendrick and men in general need to directly confront their toxicity and misogyny rather than excuse it. In the search to understand his faults, Kendrick follows the advice of Eckhart Tolle, a best-selling author and spiritual teacher. Yeah, well, you need to talk to somebody. Reach out to Eckhart. How you experience your life or what you call your life is ultimately not determined by what happens to you, it is determined by how you respond to what happens to you. In the second disc, after reassessing his behavior, Kendrick accepts himself as an imperfect human being. As he reconciles with his deeply flawed nature, Kendrick juxtaposes it with the savior role he's embraced so many years ago, realizing he's ill-equipped for it. Because of this, he looks to improve himself, a struggle most prominent in Auntie Diaries, a heartfelt song about the moment Kendrick understood the magnitude of his words. In the song, he chronicles his relationship with trans family members, as well as his use of the F slur as an adolescent. A lot of fans took issue with Kendrick's use of the word in misgendering. I can't speak on how to feel about the song's rough edges, so I'll link a trans creator for a more informed perspective. Like the person I've linked, I think Kendrick's approach was done purposefully to elicit a more visceral reaction, portraying the genuine change he went through. Just like a movie featuring a character that's initially unlikable, Kendrick portrays his younger self honestly, with all the flaws and misguided trappings of someone who isn't attuned to the hurtful words he's saying, to highlight just how how much he needed to learn. The song isn't necessarily a trans anthem. It's a timestamp of the moment Kendrick learned to empathize with someone he hadn't quite understood, for an audience that may not be aware of the harm they're perpetuating. And by the end of the song, his language changed to reflect how he's changed, as he stood up in church to defend his cousin, who's a trans woman. Man, should we love that neighbor? The laws of the land that her heart was greater. I recognize the study she was taught since birth. Performative virtue and passing judgment are central themes of the album. No matter what you're going through, Imperfection is beautiful. Feeling too judged by the world, by his community, and most of all himself, he likens the way we judge each other to the way Jesus was judged. I wear this as a representation so you'll never forget one of the greatest prophets that ever walked the earth. They judge you, they judge Christ. No matter how perfect Jesus was, he was judged all the same, suffering a terrible fate. By the end of the album, Kendrick comes to terms with his imperfection, and in turn, accepts he can't be anyone's savior. He still aims to make a difference, but no longer feels compelled to uphold an image of of a perfect, flawless figure for the people. He can only be himself. The album's finale feels like a farewell as Kendrick tearfully relinquishes his role as the voice of a generation, admits his flaws, and recommits himself to his family. At one time, Kendrick wanted us to embrace him because he felt like the fulfillment of Tupac's legacy. But now, he just hopes to be embraced, not just because of his influence, how agreeable his views are, or how perfectly he articulates ideas through music. Like all of us, he wants to be seen and accepted as a person, with all the nuance, contradictions, and beauty that come with it. One of my favorite parts of making this video was rediscovering all of Kendrick's features, including this one where he rapped in Spanish. And while I probably won't be able to rap, I've also been learning Spanish with the help of today's sponsor, Babbel. I've been brushing up on my Spanish lately because I want to have more conversations with Steph's family. Hasta pronto. Hasta pronto. Plus, it's summertime, vacation season, so perfect time to practice wherever you're traveling. Native speakers always seem to appreciate the attempt, even if you're just a beginner. Buenos dias! Babbel is especially convenient because it teaches practical, conversational language that I can use day to day with all the Spanish speakers in my life. All in 10 minute interactive lessons that don't feel too daunting if you have a busy schedule. And it's not just lessons to help me learn. I can listen to podcasts, play games, and watch videos or even live classes. Also, as someone who used to teach English as a second language, I appreciate that the lessons are designed with actual language teachers who know how students learn and improve instead of algorithms or AI. There's a 20 day money back guarantee. So if you want to learn a new language, click the link in the description and get 65% off your subscription. Thanks again to Babbel for sponsoring us. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.